Okay, now we're going to talk about network and uh, pathway uh, analysis. So you've had an introduction already to uh, gene set enrichment analysis, where uh, you are um, you kind of, uh, looking for enrichment in uh, path uh, in and groups of genes for. Uh, um, in a gene set of interests. So we're going to go a little bit beyond that now. So first we'll do a little review. So why does one want to do pathway analysis on biological data sets at all? The main reason for this is, uh, is statistical considerations. Uh, when you have thousands of genes, um, you have thousands of, of hypotheses. And that causes multiple, correct, uh, multiple testing correction problems. When you uh, reduce thousands of genes into a smaller number of pathways, often you can achieve a reduction down to dozens of pathways, you're increasing the statistical power. So now, rather than looking for overrepresentation of a um, disease process in, a, uh, in, in individual genes, you're, combining the, you're clustering and combining those genes together and looking for overrepresentation in a smaller number of pathways. It allows you to do things like find the meaning in the long tails that we often see in disease, uh, um, in disease processes. So for example, in cancer, cancer genomes, when we're looking at somatic mutations, we usually see five or six genes that have a large number of mutations, and then a very long, long, long tail of genes that are uh, uh, recurrently mutated at a low level and we don't know how to, what, how to deal with them, but often by clustering them into pathways, you start to see statistically unlikely clustering, and you can find the meaning in that long tail. And that enables you, in turn, to tell biological stories and get your papers published. So uh, I'm going to be talking uh, broadly about pathway slash network analysis. Uh, this is a very heterogeneous field. There are many different approaches. But uh, the way I define it, it's any analytic technique that makes use of biological pathway or molecular interaction information to gain insights into a biological system. And because we're in a cancer institute here, a lot of my examples will be drawn from cancer. But by no means do I mean to limit this just to, can just to cancer. Pathway network analysis is a hot and very rapidly evolving t uh, field. And there are many different approaches that people, people use for this. So let's, let's look at what the difference between a pathway and a network is. Uh, so uh, pathway, so again, this is, this is my definition. It's not the broad definition by any, mean, by, uh, any stretch of the imagination. But the way I like to look at it is a pathway is the detailed biochemical view of, uh, of a biological process, the thing that we like to draw on the blackboard when we're, when, when we're explaining the causation of a particular biological uh, phenomenon. So for example, here is a traditional uh, pathway view of the um, uh, epidermal growth factor receptor uh, pathway, the initial, uh, initial part of the signaling pathway, where uh, EGFR receptor and the EGF ligand um, uh, bind to each other, forming a, uh, a complex. This is inhibited by a, 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 a negative inhibitor. Then there are uh, then there's a dimerization step. ATP is hydrolyzed to ADP, uh, causing um, uh, creating a, uh, a phospho um, uh, product of the of the dimer. Which then has further pathway, further steps below, and this is uh, there's a positive regulator SRC1 here, and this is all this is um, generally the way we 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 create our hypotheses and, and interpret them. Um, unfortunately, this type of representation is very difficult to scale, and it's very difficult to do large quantitative um, computation computation over. So often, uh, if not usually. Um, this very detailed me mechanical model gets turned into a logic model uh, call, um, uh, represented as a network. And, this, and in this network, we're throwing away all the detailed information. 
That is, there's a dimerization, there's ATP hydrolysis as a phosphorylation step, uh, and instead we're just capturing the logical association. EGF uh, activates EGFR, um, LRG1 um, inhibits, um, inhibits this interaction. Uh, the nice thing about the network uh, representation is you can start adding other information where uh, other types of interactions where you don't know the exact mechanism, but there's, say, genetic information or there's proteomic information that shows that these, um, these additional genes, KRT17, are interacting somehow. We don't know exactly how, but we can do, our, we can do some network analysis even with that um, limited amount of information. And so you can convert, by the way, from the pathway representation to the network uh, uh, representation, but you can't go back the other way because there's information loss. So I'm going to give you now three different, talk about three different types of pathway network analysis. Um, they, they start simple and they become increasingly complex, um, but they all start out with the same set of ingredients. There, there, there are basically two. One is a list of uh, altered genes, proteins, or RNAs um, that you will be analyzing. So this comes out of your own experiment. You've done a, uh, a CRISPR knockout and then done an RNA-seq, and you found that a bunch of genes went up in expression and a bunch of genes went down. That's your list. The second is you need a source of pathways or networks to analyze your data set with. So let's talk about where those ingredients come from. So pathway databases, and there are uh, quite a few of them, um, are databases which collect the me mechanical, bio mechanistic, biochemical representation of biological processes. Um, they are usually curated. They provide an intuitive, human-readable view of biological process. They capture causation, uh, unlike networks. Um, and they have a human interpretable visualization because we have been educated to, to understand these diagrams. Uh, disadvantages uh, are uh, because they're curated, they don't usually cover the whole genome. That's, it's, a hum, it's human labor and it's also limited by what gets, what gets into the literature. Uh, and in addition, it's very subjective. Different databases will disagree on the boundaries of pathways. So going back to my uh, EGF example, um, the EGF signaling pathway actually leads into uh, a um, in, into the RAS path, RAS signaling pathway, which is then fed into by a bunch of other signaling pathways, including uh, 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 TG, TGF and others, um, which uh, you know which actually interact all together. So when you carve out something called the EGF pathway, where, where you're drawing those boundaries, uh, and different um, uh, different researchers uh, make different uh, make different reasonable choices. So one pathway database, is EGF pathway, is not may not be the same as another pathways. That's a that's a problem in in, in communication and reproducibility. Here's an example of a classic pathway. This is, um, I think this is this is a pentose, the, the, the pentose uh, glucuronate pathways, uh, represented in uh, KEG, the Kyoto Encyclopedia of Genes and Genomes. I think most of you have seen these diagrams. Uh, KEG is a uh, the the longest, uh, the oldest, and most storied of the pathway databases. It is uh, curates. Um, uh, biochemical reactions in uh, multiple multiple organisms and maps them onto multiple species from prokaryotes up to human, uh, and uh, uh, annotates everything using uh, uh, EC numbers. So its ability it represents it's it's a good sort. EC numbers are enzyme the enzyme commission um, uh, uh, identifiers for for uh, for enzymatic activity. Uh, its advantage is that it's quite comprehensive. It covers multiple species. The disadvantage is that because it's based on enzyme activity numbers and there is not a one-to-one -one mapping between enzyme activity and uh, uh, genes and proteins, um, there's a lot of, can be a lot of source of confusion, confusion in it. 
In addition, KEG has changed its business model over the last few years, and it's no longer completely open. You have to license it. Uh, the Reactome database, which uh, I'll talk about a lot because it's a, it's a product of, of my lab in collaboration with uh, NYU, uh, EBI, and uh, OHSU in uh, Oregon, um, is, a, uh, is another pathway database. It's probably the large, I think it is the largest open um, pathway database um, in, uh, the, uh, for human. Uh, and it cover, it, um, it is a, it's created by a, a team of curators who read the literature and create a, uh, a data model from which we can create, which we can create these pathway diagrams. And it focuses largely on, uh, disease-related pathways, signaling pathways, developmental pathways, response to infectious disease, and other um, uh, pathways that people are interested in. We also take a somewhat opportunistic approach if we're approached by a, a researcher who says, well, you really don't cover the field that I'm working in, such as retinal development. We say, oh, well, that's great. We'll work with you to, uh, to curate retinal development. Can you spend some time reviewing articles for us? And so it is created, Reactome is created by a collaboration between curators, expert authors, and it's peer-reviewed. So each of the each of the reactions that we represent has a um, has been uh, reviewed by at least one uh, uh, one peer. So it, we have uh, rigorous curation standards. Every reaction is traceable into a reference in the primary literature. We do cover non-human species, but a lot of that is automated. We do computation through uh, orthology to create non-human non -human pathways. And at the current time, we cover a little bit more than half of the human genome, 10,651 in the last release, across 2,132 pathways. It provides a, uh, a Google-style zoomable, uh, zoomable map that you can overlay your and other people's information on. Uh, and you can do some, uh, uh, you can do some uh, pathway and network analysis using Reactome tools. We'll go into that in more detail. And it's open access. Anyone can use it. There's no, no fee. Uh, you can republish it. No, no restrictions whatsoever. So that's, uh, those, that's where you get, so pathway, uh, so those are a, a couple of pathway databases. There are many more. I'll give you a resource where you can get the comprehensive list in a bit. So networks uh, capture um, more of more of the genome, uh, including the less well understood portion. And any anything that you can um, and networks can span a large variety of interactions. Any two molecular entities, whether they're lipids or proteins or DNA or DNA and proteins, um, you can make a network out of. So you can create networks that, uh, sp uh, that span genetic interactions. Uh, for example, you can capture suppressor enhancer space. <coughs> Physical interactions like proteomic pulldowns or these two hybrid experiments. Co-expression data. Sharing of go terms or literature citations or authors who publish on them or adjacency in pathways. Uh, when you're working with networks, it's really important to understand this key this key fact that um, uh, network that uh, there are many many different kinds of networks. And so you have to understand what your net, well, you know what the most appropriate network is for the problem you're trying to solve. Pathways are much more homogeneous in that respect. So network databases again they can be built via curation and have a group of people sitting in a cinder block room. Um, uh, curing the literature and building these up. Um, or you can build them automatically from high throughput experiments. And most network databases are built in both ways. They have extensive coverage, much more extensive coverage of biological systems. Some of them have all the genes in them in one way or another. Uh, however, they, are, um, they have a higher uh, uh, error rate. They, uh, generally, the underlying evidence is weaker, and the relationships are less well understood. And so the interactions are less reliable uh, on the whole, not that they're not useful. Popular sources of curated networks include BioGrid, Intact, and Mint. Each of them have tens to hundreds of thousands of genes, some in one species, some in multiple species. 
Uh, the comprehensive list of uh, pathway and network databases can be found at this resource called Pathway Commons, which is um, uh, hosted by Memorial Sloan Kettering and multiple in New York and multiple collaborators. And here um, you can get a comprehensive list of all the network and pathway databases with a little a brief description of each one. And uh, you can download information from uh, a large subset of them. They've created MSKCC and um, Pathway Commons has created a common interchange language called Biopax that allows um, various participating pathway network databases to submit their data in this common language. And then they get integrated and merged together um, in, uh, with this, uh, a web-based uh, interface. So you can actually get pathway and network data, data here as well. Okay, so that's, those are the two ingredients um, where you get pathway and network data. What do you do when, you, when, when you've got them? There are basically three ways, uh, three different uh, classes of pathway and network analysis um, that, uh, that I'll take you through here. The first one you've already seen, this is gene set enrichment. And in uh, gene set enrichment, the, uh, the basic strategy is to take a a pathway or network and break it into clusters of related genes, proteins, or other um, molecular entities. So a typical one, a classic way to break it is by uh, using the gene ontology. And you divide the, uh, the biological network into uh, uh, 500 or so categories based on what biological process or what subcellular compartment that gene participates in. Uh, other ways of doing it are you accept, uh, you, you take a pathway database like Reactome or Keg, and you use the, the pathway name, whatever the curators decided was the correct boundary for, um, for that pathway. And then using your gene list, you look for overrepresentation of the genes or proteins in your gene list in one or more of the bins that you created from that pathway or uh, pathway or network database, okay, and that should be familiar to everybody. The at this point, um, the um, uh, advantage of this is it's uh, is that the statistics are very well understood. Uh, it's straightforward. You have plentiful tools, both uh, online tools and command line uh, locally run tools, um, to do this. Um, and uh, people, people basically understand um, the, uh, what, the results, what the results mean. Uh, the disadvantage is that uh, um, there are many, many different gene ways of, of slicing and dicing the genome. Um, there is a tendency, uh, it's subjective, and there's a tendency for people to uh, keep picking gene, different gene sets until they find the answers that they, they want. Um, and uh, there's, uh, there's that bit of subjectivity that is, uh, uh, is not good. Second is the problem that uh, uh, in most gene set, uh, um, uh, uh, that most gene set enrichment algorithms don't do well with uh, genes that belong in multiple sets. Some of them will, will, will correct, will correct for it. Most do not. Um, and, uh, you can end up emphasizing one bin at the expense of another based on an arbitrary decision of uh, which bin to put a gene into. Okay. However, that being said, uh, GSEA is the gene set enrichment analysis is um, probably the first thing one should do, and it gives you a lot of information. The second uh, class of pathway network analysis is uh, subnetwork construction and clustering. And in this technique, you do not start with a preconceived notion of uh, of of what sets the genes in the gene uh, what sets the genes belong to. Uh, instead, you discover them from the network by looking at your by, uh, uh, through your data. So you start out with a network of all possible interactions, whether they be physical interactions or genetic interactions or sharing of go terms or whatever. Uh, and then you superimpose your gene list on this network in order to identify 
uh, clustering, uh, statistically unlikely clustering of your gene list inside that network. So you find, for example, that um, your, uh, the, the, instead of being scattered throughout the entire network, all the genes in your list are clustered in one, one group of, uh, among, uh, in one little section of the, of the, of the network. And then by uh, extracting that, the, that, that cluster and uh, looking at um, what genes your, your list are interacting with, you can start to tell stories and understand um, what, is, uh, what is going on there. So it's an unsupervised style discovery of, um, uh, of the potential role of the genes that are on your gene list. And there are quite a few, quite a few published and heavily used uh, programs that allow you, let you do that. Um, the final method, the most complex one, is, uh, is uh, pathway modeling. And here, instead of um, lo losing the information that, the, um, that happens when you go from a network into, from a pathway into a network, uh, you, um, uh, the algorithms attempt to build a computational model of the pathway itself. So that the, the, the sequence of events, the cause and effect relationships remain, remain there. And this, is, this shades into systems biology, um, but it allows you to put your gene list on and see what the integrated effects of, the, um, uh, of alterations in that gene list would be. So a, a typical example is uh, you've, um, you've sequenced a cancer genome and you found two different genes in the TGF pathway that have been altered. Um, you don't know for sure that, that that's a significant finding, but you put them onto a, a model of the TGF pathway and you find that yes indeed those two genes will inter interact with each other in the pathway in order to um, constitutively activate the pathway. Or perhaps they will they will do nothing, or perhaps they will decrease the the the, um, the pathway activity. But it, it it gives you a prediction that you can then test. Okay, and then there are, are a number of pieces of software for this, um, all of which are um, less um, uh, harder to harder to use and uh, um, uh, less commonly used in the literature, but are gaining in importance. Okay, and so the, 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 you use these three methods to answer three different types of questions. For gene set enrichment, um, it helps you ask, answer the question of what biological processes are altered in this disease. I'm using cancer as my, as my example. Um, for um, de novo subnetwork construction, you can discover new pathways or identify differences among tumors or among patients that are uh, related to um, which subnetworks are affected by the alterations in the genome in that patient. And for the final way, it allows you to ask how are the pathway activities altered in the particular pathway patient, and to add, to ask and answer um, thought experiments like can I identify members of the pathway which are targetable by drugs or by genetic ma manipulations. Okay, so let's go through these in more in more detail. Enrichment to fix gene sets. Um, I think I said everything uh, everything on this already, um, but the the main advantages are it's easy to perform and there are lots of tools to do it, and the disadvantages are the arbitrariness of the gene sets, um, and that. At the end of the day, you get a bag of gene, but you don't have the regulatory relationships among them, and you still have to do a lot of work in order to understand what the enrichment is telling you. For de novo subnetwork construction and clustering, the, uh, the, the process is very straightforward. Um, using the appropriate algorithms, you, you take your list of altered macromolecules, genes, proteins, and RNAs, and you apply them to uh, the biological network of your choice, and the algorithm will identify topologically unlikely configurations. Uh, you can then extract those clusters of unlikely configurations, and then uh, and usually there will be a small number of them, 
you know, um, a half a dozen to a dozen, and then you can annotate the clusters to understand what it is that you've um, you've discovered. And in fact, kind of in a, in a iterative way, you can annotate the clusters that you discovered from this uh, from you discovered from the network analysis using gene set enrichment techniques. So you found a cluster; it has some of the genes that you applied plus some others that are close to each other, you can now annotate the whole thing and say, oh, oh, these are all part of the ribosome, for example. So here's an example of doing this with the reactome, um, FI, uh, uh, reactome. Um, this is from a publication in Genome Biology about seven years ago now. Uh, what we did here, and this was done by my colleague Guanming Wu, who's now at OHSU, is to uh, take the curated pathway databases that were present in, in Reactome, turn those into a network, and then added uncurated high-throughput interaction data. And at that point, it's mostly yeast to hybrid data. Since then, we've added modern code transcription data and uh, other types of networks to create a big hairball. And then we used machine learning uh, techniques to, to weed out false connections from the, from the um, from the yeast 2 hybrid data in order to reduce the number of false positive uh, interactions. And that, and that gave us 11,000 proteins and 270,000 interactions. The network has still grown, has grown since then. Um, and then the next thing one does is to take a, a gene list, and our usual use case was uh, somatic mutations in a cancer, um, apply that to the network uh, and then to uh, use the same algorithms that are used to identify social social groups, social clicks in Facebook or on the web um, or other web-based social networks, to find groups of our genes which are talking to each other, interacting to, with each other more frequently than you would expect by chance. And this pulls out a series of clusters which we can then annotate. And in cancer, these end up usually these end up being signaling sig signaling clusters or clusters having to do with cell cycle or cell motility or, or usually things that you would expect. If you do it on a, a, a um, autism spectrum disorder, you get lots of clusters having to do with neural development, which is reassuring. Um, and then, and then, what do you do after that? Okay, so I'll, I'll give you an example in a second. Of what, why, why this is useful? So, uh, okay, as of the current date, the Reactum FI network has grown to twelve thousand two hundred eighty genes, two hundred thirty thousand uh, functional interactions, has sixty percent coverage of the genome. So we still can't say anything about the eight thousand genes which are not well expressed or not well annotated in the literature or don't come down in. Uh, yeast to hybrid screens. Um, we believe the false positive rate to be less than 1%. Uh, however, the false negative rate is quite high because there's a lot about the, uh, a lot about the genome we don't know. So that's the ca big caveat. And it's a very big complex network. I'm just showing you 5% here. And you can kind of see the clustering that has to do with complexes um, and, uh, and, and pathways. Okay, so here's an example of using this. Um, the um, labels didn't come out very well, but you'll get the general idea. This is um, uh, 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 exome sequencing of, uh, or whole genome sequencing of 52 pancreatic cancers. Um, there are more than 200 recurrently mutated genes in this. Uh, and here's a typical long tail with a few genes, KRAS, P53, SMAD4, um, being highly, very frequently recurrently mutated, we can immediately say that these are driver genes. Um, but then there's a long tail that goes way, way, way out of things which are still way out here. There, are five out of the 52 patients are, are um, uh, have recurrent mutations. They have a, um, a, a roughly a 10% uh, uh, mutation frequency. We don't know whether these are real or not. They don't, uh, they don't um, meet the statistical cutoffs for calling a driver gene by recurrence alone. So what do we do with this? Well, if we do that clustering and extraction, we end up with a total of um, uh, 11, 11 um, uh, clusters of highly interacting genes. And by and large, they, make, they are what we expect. 
We have a, a, a large module which has KRAS right in the middle, which is highly frequently mutated in, uh, um, in pancreatic cancer and involves ERB signaling, FGF signaling, EGF signaling, uh, and axon, axon guidance, which is one of the, uh, the processes known to be altered in, uh, um, in pancreatic cancer. We have another one for P53 signaling, another one for hedgehog, TGF beta. We have all the um, extracellular matrix interactions um, that have been associated with metastasis. Um, and then we have things that are coming from other cell types in the, um, uh, in the genome, uh, such as uh, 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 lymphocytes. So we have MHC class 2 in here, and we have the splices. So. Uh, you, can, uh, 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 you can then do kind of fun stuff with this. So for example, one of the things we were able to do with this pancreatic cancer set is to identify four major uh, genomic subtypes of pancreatic cancer based on which, mo um, which modules are mutated in any individual uh, patient. Um, the, uh, uh, so one type is characterized by absence of the first three, uh, the first three modules and uh, um, mutations in module 7. I forget which one that is. There's another one characterized by um, mutations in modules 2, 1, and 10, one that's uh, characterized by 2 and 10, and so forth and so on. Um, this, if you attempted to do this just on the genes themselves, you don't get any, you get very little clustering at all. So this gave us some subtype information. Um, in this case, however, the four different subtypes didn't have any difference in prognosis, so it was of academic interest. However, when we did this in, um, in uh, breast cancer, um, we actually very readily found a, a, a strong biomarker of survival. So here is an example um, in which uh, one of the modules that we found in uh, early stage estrogen receptor positive breast cancer involved genes from M phase of the cell, cell cycle and Aurora B signaling, it it's clearly has to do with mitotic activity. And when you apply this to um, breast cancer survival, um, high expression of the any of the genes in this module are associated with a, uh, uh, a, a, a much worse um, uh, survival free survival. Um, uh, disease-free uh, survival. Patients do much worse than if they have low, exp low expression shown in the red line. And in fact, the effect is so strong that patients um, with high activity in these, uh, in, in these modules uh, have as bad a survival as patients with triple negative breast cancer, which is uh, um, uh, um, generally considered uh, um, Highly, uh, highly actionable. Patients with estrogen receptor positive breast cancer would usually get um, a, uh, a kind of non-aggressive non therapy, surg surgery, a little neoadjuvant therapy, and then watch and wait. People, patients with triple negative would get much more aggressive treatment. And this argues that there is a subset of patients in the estrogen receptor positive group that should be treated more, uh, should be watched more, treated more aggressively. So there are multiple uh, uh, algorithms that will do this type of clustering. Um, gene, ma gene mania is a, uh, uh, a fantastic web service that uh, was developed by Quade Morris and Gary Bader um, at University of Toronto, uh, right here. And it uses a birds of a feather principle to identify genes that are related to an experimentally defined set. You upload your list of genes to a web to a, their, the Gene Mania website, and it create it extracts and creates modules for you, and it has several hundred different networks that you can apply uh, to this. So you can choose the network that is of the best that is best suited for your experimental questions. Uh, one of the disadvantages of Gene Mania is that there's ascertainment bias, um, and genes which are very highly connected have been very well studied, like p53, tend to create clusters no matter what you, what you do, just because they have lots of connections and they end up coming down. Uh, the, uh, the HotNet program that was written by 
uh, Ben Raphael at uh, Brown University in Rhode Island uh, attend, attend, avoids this ascertainment bias by modeling the network as a um, as a metallic lattice. When you put a, when you put an upregulate, you then put a series of upregulated or downregulated genes in it, and it creates hot or cold spots. And then it uses thermal diffusion to um, uh, to identify hot regions of the network. Um, when you have a highly connected gene like p53, it has lots of connections, so the heat disperses more quickly. And this, uh, I've never understood why um, this uh, um, this way of modeling networks actually makes any sense, to be honest. But it does produce very um, uh, um, uh, very useful results, and it's been used to identify uh, drug targets and to identify tumor subtypes. So it works, even though if you can't explain exactly why it works. Um, there are then a, a, a couple of cytoscape applications, and you've all used cytoscape at this point, right? Yeah, uh, which I recommend. One is called uh, hypermodules, and this is a very good. Um, a general purpose a tool for finding and extracting network clusters. It allows you to um, co-cluster with clinical characteristics. So if you have a gene list of upregulated expressed genes and you're looking for a clinical, clinical characteristic such as um, high rate of migraine headache, you can put those two together and it will find clusters which are correlated with the clinical with patients who have have the migraine phenotype, uh, and then uh, the rea the um, reactum functional interaction network has its own bespoke cytoscape app. Will actually be you'll actually be doing an exercise using it um, when um, uh, after I finish this lecture, um, and this is based. Uh, this is more limited than the others because it's it it uses the the, the reactum fi network and you can't change it. But within it, it offers multiple clustering and, correla clustering and correlation algorithms, uh, including HotNet, including Paradigm that I'll talk about, and allows you to do, to do, um, uh, uh, to do survival correlation uh, right within the application, it's designed specifically for, uh, um, for uh, cancer genome analysis. OK, so then the last. Um, um, type of um, network pathway uh, analysis I'll talk about is pathway-based modeling. So in, in pathway-based modeling, um, there is a, um, a, a you or the algorithm creators have created a computational model of, a, of one or more pathways in which the relationships between upstream and downstream events the positive and negative regulatory uh, relationships and their um, and their weights have been preserved, and this then allows you to apply a list of list of altered genes and the direction in which they're altered to the model, compute over it, and see what the effect is on downstream uh, downstream um, uh, 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 effectors of the pathway. So you can do very specific things like looking for um, increases or decreases in a particular phosphorylated, active phosphorylated product, or look for decreases or increases or decreases of ubiquina ubiquinolation of a, uh, um, of, a, of a product, or the presence or the activation of a transcription factor. Uh, so it uh, it, uh, it attempts to, to preserve and integrate the multiple molecular alterations, and it is uh, kind of the ba a baby set step into systems biology. So um, there are this is where there's an incredible diversity in, in the community. I'm just giving you a very superficial list of um, uh, the, the, the the most popular tools. Um, there are um, Many different many different formalisms that people use. Uh, the oldest is, is uh, partial differential equations based on reaction kinetics. Um, software like CellNet Analyzer is used. These are mostly suitable for um, metabolomics and biochemical systems, such as uh, yeast in fermentation 
uh, um, undergoing, ferm uh, undergoing fermentation, where you're predicting from the reaction kinetics what happens when you add maltose to the mix. Uh, they, um, they're good for up to a couple dozen genes, after which time the computation becomes increasingly intractable. Uh, and unless anyone here is using <laughs> metabolomics, you probably won't use these. Then there are information flow models that, have, that are designed for signaling cascades, usually uh, mostly for kinase cascades. The two that uh, uh, I'm most familiar with are NetForest and Network Kin from um, uh, Uppsala, Univer uh, Uppsala University in, in Sweden. Uh, and they model specific uh, signaling pathways. They have pre-built models of most of the ones that you would be interested in. And um, you can um, uh, perform experiments on these models to see what the effect on signaling would be from, a mut from uh, uh, mutations or other alterations in, in that pathway. For transcriptional regulatory networks, the best software that I'm, I, I know of and the oldest is from a called Arachne from Andrea Califano's group at Columbia University. What this allows you to do is give an RNA-seq or microarray data uh, across a series of perturbations, typically used in knockdown experiments or transfection experiments. It will build a cell-specific regulatory network for you and allow you to identify the key master regulators of the process, so the transcriptional switches. Uh, <clears throat> and it does this uh, using an information, uh, uh, a information uh, a theory, um, uh, theory paradigm. And then um, there's a large family of <clears throat> methods called uh, prob based on probabilistic graph models. Um, these are a <clears throat> um, these build a logic model of the pathway with. Um, um, arrows of influence between each pair of each pair of genes. There can be positive influences and negative influences. And from a data set, you can learn the weights of these influences uh, and then integrate across them so that if there is an uh, a, a, a increase in the activity of a gene up here at the top, it'll propagate that changes down through the various positive and negative um, um, arcs and tell you what happens at the bottom. The most popular of these al of the algorithms that are used is called Paradigm from Joshua Stewart's lab at um, UCSC, and it's been used very extensively for cancer analysis. So I'm going to give you an example from of how Paradigm works. This is a very uh, this is a, a very simple example. We have um, a, a very reduced uh, view of p53 where the MDM2 gene inhibits p53 activity, and p53 activity promotes um, apoptosis. So if you increase p53, apoptosis will go up. If you increase MDM2 activity, a p53 activity will go down, and apoptosis will go down. Very simple model. OK. Now, even this model turns out to be much more complicated at the genomic level, because you can have alterations at the gene level, or at the RNA level, or at the protein level. So you can uh, increase MDM, you can, let's say, decrease MDM activity by knocking out the gene, or you can hypermethylate the gene and reduce the amount of RNA, or you can degrade the protein. And I have a question here. Go ahead. When you talk about genome and genes, are they mm -hmm. You can absolutely put the non-coding genes as well, as long as, you under, as long as you know what they're doing. So if you have a link RNA, and you know for sure that it, that it, is, um, uh, you know, it is activating a, um, um, uh, a gene in apoptosis or some other pathway, then you can, you can absolutely put that in. Okay? Okay. Same thing for P53. Uh, oh, yeah, I'm using the wrong mouse. And... Uh, so alterations at any of these levels have a different, uh, can have a, a different effect uh, on the activity of the protein or gene itself. And then the proteins uh, interact with each other to, um, uh, to, cause the, uh, uh, to cause the effect. 
Okay, so oh yeah, and here's some examples of the various things that Paradigm was developed to uh, um, was developed to handle. So you do a genomics experiment on a cancer, you can find mutations, you can find changes in RNA expression. Sorry about that. You can have copy number changes. You can assay by mass spec, and Paradigm is set up so that you can you can put one or more or all of these types of omics analysis into the model and get um, a sensible result out of it. And it, it, it actually works quite well. If you apply it to a complex cancer type, such as uh, a glioblastoma multiforme, uh, you readily find uh, sub, um, subtypes of the cancer, which have to do with the, which um, uh, each of which has a different set of network activities, pathway activities, that are either upregulated or downregulated by the particular combination of mutations in that in that uh, in that cancer. So what we're looking at here are whoops, clicking are patients going across the columns. So each one is a different tumor, and then the rows are members uh, are the um, the integrated and inferred pathway activities. Of, of a series of, of a series of pathways they built models for. So for example, the um, interleukin uh, GATA pathway here is very strongly downregulated in subtype 3 and not that significantly downregulated in the other three subtypes in e, uh, for uh, EGF uh, receptor, uh, types 3 and types 2 uh, are both tend to upregulate these. So this has been discovered, this has been used to discover multiple uh, cancer subtypes. In some cases they've had clinical, they've had clinical significance. Now the good and bad news about Paradigm itself is that it's actually rather hard to run because it's distributed in a source code form, somewhat hard to get installed in your, your machine, and um, the uh, and making it even more difficult is there are no pre-formatted pathway models. You have to go in, curate the literature yourself, and create the models, which can be quite quite difficult. Also takes a while to run. Um, the the good news about this is that it's one of the algorithms that we put into Reactome F5 is uh, in the Cytoscape app. Uh, we it runs Paradigm, and uh, we have pre-populated it with pathway models based on Reactome. We've also improved performance so that it runs in a reasonable time and can uh, actually uh, uh, actually run in, run in uh, minutes to hours rather than uh, days. So and uh, you will see some you'll, you will get a taste of Reactome Viz when uh, Robin Hall gives his workshop in, in a few minutes. And that is the end of what I wanted to cover. It's just it's an overview of the field. Uh, I'm ending with some useful um, uh, uh, URLs for databases and for algorithms that you can use. They're all in your materials. And I want to thank everybody for your attention. And I'm happy to answer questions for a few minutes, uh, after which I need to run off to a, to a meeting, which explains why I'm dressed this way, in case you're wondering. So any questions, comments? Yeah. Um, uh, in the Pectin modules clustering, you said that you, you found the trends by clustering the network, but not when you clustered the genes. Yeah, if you tr mm -hmm. And you meant gene expression, gene expression. Well, in this case, we're clustering uh, um, clustering uh, um, individual tumors by uh, mutations in the genes, so um, protein coding changes. Okay, and there are there are um, six frequently mutated genes, and another two hundred which are not so frequently mutated. We tried to find patterns in just the mutations of the genes. Didn't really get anything. When we turned it into um, network clusters, we got you know very we got very strong uh, patterns. It wasn't no. That's that's exactly exactly the point. So sometimes you would have so our, our biggest module was KRAS, and KRAS is mutated in ninety five percent of pancreatic cancers. 
But it turns out there are many other genes which are in, uh, more uh, rarely mutated. Uh, and sometimes you would get no KRAS mutation, but, but a lot of mutations in genes that, have to, that are in the pathway. So they end up getting clustered together. Yeah. Okay, so the question is whether the tools can be used to analyze data from model organisms or non-model. Uh, the answer is um, uh, is that in, in many cases, uh, yes, you can, but there has to be a source of the pathway or network information. And so uh, it needs to be an an well annotated, well annotated genome in order for any of this to work. Uh, so you need to you need to have um, uh, the the best scenarios in which it's uh, the animal you're looking at is related to some model organism that has been annotated. So it's a nematode. It, say it's a nematode, then you can use uh, the C. elegans annotations for it, and then use orthology information to transfer over go annotation terms or networks and pathways that have been built. But it will require some some upfront work in order for you to in order for you to do it. And if it's a um, you know it's a it's a it's a, a species that has not been well studied, then you might be out of luck. Mm -hmm.